So, all right. Let's finish chapter three today. What do you say? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a plan. Okay, it's a plan. So we were finishing up the letter to Philadelphia. Okay. Yes. Not our Philadelphia, no. <laughs> no. So, so is it just like a number? This is all Asia Minor. This oh. is all the, the western coast of Asia Minor. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. No, it's, I'm sure it's got a Turkish name. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, the Turks are not very uh, creative. I mean, as far as their names, I don't know what Philadelphia is called today. Oh. But the, some of these towns have disappeared. They remain as titles to bishops. So in the Synod in, in Constantinople, you have a bishop of Philadelphia, a bishop of, actually the bishop of Sardis is a Vigilus, who is actually here in the, in the United States. Uh, there is Smyrnis, there's, no. but Smyrna today is called Ismir, which is, again, when the Turk will ask a Greek, where are you going? Istin Smyrna, Smyrna. So Ismir. No different than when they say, where are you going to Constantinople? Istin Polin, Istanbul. So while they insist that it does not get called Constantinople because they don't want to be reminded of Constantine, and yet the name Istanbul is still a Greek name, right? So, so now speaking of Constantinople, just so uh, Dimitri here, who's right behind you, he'll be having a presentation on March 31st after church in the upper room on his pilgrimage uh, to Constantinople that was sponsored by the Archons, is that correct? Pilgrimage of Discovery. And um, you'll speak about what he saw and also how young people can apply to, right, to be sponsored to go on this pilgrimage, is that correct? Okay, so that's Sunday, the March 31st in the upper room. So especially if you have college kids, college grads, uh, find out they're going to continue, right, Dimitri? They're going to continue this program. Yeah. Yeah. So for. Uh, mm-hmm. So I mean, it's a process to start thinking about. So. Yeah. Plus, also to tell us what you saw. So, okay, March 31st. Good. Uh, but yeah, Philadelphia is all in the neighborhood of Smyrna, Ephesus, yeah, Laodicea, Sardis. All the seven cities are within, I would say, you know, so Patmos is on the sort of central eastern Mediterranean. So if, he, if he's writing to cities just on the shore of Asia Minor, so to say, within his own jurisdiction, even though the letters are written to all of us and through all time. Right? So Philadelphia. Uh, let's see, who wants to read the uh, wants to read the letter? Nia, you want to read the letter again? Uh, Starting with verse seven. Yeah. Okay. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write: These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. He that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that not that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Thank you. 
So we spoke about evangelism. Last time we talked about the joy of evangelism, how we, it's actually a duty to evangelize and to speak about the gospel. And to do so, it doesn't require great eloquency, it doesn't require some kind of special gifts, right? It's just uh, the Lord is the one that provides and opens the door and brings people. Uh, the apostles did not really have anything material, did not have any social status, did not have any wealth, uh, no special education, really, for most of them. Uh, but he provides the door for people to come. So the work of evangelism is the gift of Christ. So to bring people into the church is something that Christ does. We often have lots of conferences, lots of meetings, right? They will have uh, to figure out the silver bullet, how to bring youth to the church, how to bring the surrounding population to the church, how to bring other people to the church. Uh, the elephant in the room is what? Christ brings people. We need to be with Christ, to hold on to his commandments, to keep his word, as it says here. This epistle is an epistle of praise. It says, um, you have kept my word. You have not denied my name. So he will bring the people from all over to the church, including the enemies of the church. And here specifically, where is he bringing people from? Where is he bringing people from? Jesus is bringing people from somewhere, right? From verse, in verse 9. He says, indeed, I would make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they're Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Okay, that is the first, in a sense, promise or, or reward to these people of Philadelphia who have kept God's name and have not denied it. First thing is, he will bring people. He will bring people that were unexpected, people that are enemies of the church. We have talked about synagogue of Satan. Why is he, are they Satan worshipers? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, they're not expecting explicitly worshiping tell us they're not explicitly worshiping satan there's no belzebul statue inside the synagogue they still have the word of god they still have the torah right? the uh the first five books of the old testament they're still speaking about the prophets they're still reading psalms they're not singing psalms to belzebul or some, some kind of demon but it's called synagogue of satan why It is a synagogue. It is, they are claiming to be Jews, but Jews, if they are real, they would have done what? If the Jews were faithful Jews, what would they? What should they have done? Believe in Christ. Believe in Christ. Okay. Right. <laughs> Believe in Christ. That is why they are a synagogue of Satan, because if they were true Jews, we are all true Jews. We are the new Israel, but essentially we are the Israel. We are the people who have received the promise right, of the eternal life, of God's kingdom, of the promised land, the inheritance of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, where the Jews see themselves as the inheritors of uh, in the flesh, meaning they are tracing their lineage back to the 12 tribes of Israel, who is actually Jacob, who is the son of Isaac, who is the son of Abraham. He was renamed Israel. Right? Jacob was renamed Israel by God himself when he gave them the promise that you know, his descendants will also see the, the, the promised land which they saw, of course, 400 years after Jacob died in Egypt. And his body was brought to the promised land, and eventually the people were led out of Egypt with, with Moses to the Red Sea, to the promised land. Those are the Jews in the flesh. However, those are not the people 
that will inherit what was promised to Abraham and his descendants. Because he wasn't speaking about inheritance by people in the flesh, but rather inheritance of the people in faith. And that is why when we pray for the dead, what do we say? Place him in the bosom of Abraham. Abraham. So are we Jewish or not? We are very much Jewish. Not by you no know, the flesh, but in the spirit, in faith. Yes, Thanasia. I'm sorry? The new Rome? What do you mean the new Rome? You mean the Constantinople being the new Rome? That is, well, that's a whole, yeah, that's a different topic altogether. Uh, that is a topic of Constantinople being the new Rome, the new capital of the Roman Empire, ecclesiastically the capital, in a sense, of the church. And then Moscow being the third Rome, is that what you're implying? Right? Moscow always wants to be the third Rome. Right? The second Rome, third Rome, first Rome. All those things are really jurisdictional issues of on earth. Uh, we're speaking about humanity. If humanity were descendants of Adam and Eve, and then God pressed the reset button with Noah, so we can say that we come from bad stock. Right? We, if Adam and Eve were considered bad stock, then God pressed the reset button. So we are all descendants of Noah, of a faithful man who spent a hundred years building a boat, uh, waiting for a promise that was so crazy and out there that yet still believed. Imagine the ridicule he received through his entire, those entire 100 years in which he's building a boat, telling people that the flood is coming. But no, no less believed, or no more believed than today, right? When we say, please come to the church, what are you really saying? Fire is coming. It's going to kill everybody except the ones in the church. That's why every church is a, an ark. Every single church, not as a building, you know, although as buildings, it's, they're built like upside down, ark, upside down arcs. But as a concept, as an institution, as, as a community, we're not communities of social service only. We're not communities of just moral um, uplifting of society. We're not moral police. We're not uh, sort of the, uh, uh, somewhere where people can socialize, all of the above. But most importantly, there is the end. It's coming. A flood, or in this case, fire, is coming. And whoever is in the ark of Noah lived. How many people lived outside of the ark? Zero. No. As to the story. So we're all descendants of Noah and his family. So we are descendants of good stuff. And then humanity still strayed from God. So God can promise not to press the reset button again. So what did he do? He picked a man of faith who listened. Was he the first one? Was he the first person that he told, move from your land and go over there? And maybe a lot of people said no. Maybe Abraham was the first one to say yes. That's how you already know Abraham. Move from here, go here. Move from here, go there. And I will give you everything. I will give you descendants. And that promise was made when Abraham was 75 years old. How long before he actually got a descendant? 24 years later, he was 99. Right? And when he did get a descendant, when the descendant was eight years old, God asked him to slit his throat. Right? So a man of faith. Were there other people that he put the same questions to and they denied him? Possibly. But the Bible is about the people that said yes. We don't know about the people that said no. That's why the Bible even... Just regular sinners that come through the narrative of whatever stories that we study usually have no name because they have no name in the book of life. But we only know about the people that said yes. So could there have been other candidates of the Virgin Mary? Huh? We don't know. We don't know. 
other 15 year olds who were asked, do you want to be the mother of God? And so and so. Who knows? We'll never know. But he is the one that said yes. Abraham is the one that said yes. We are in the spirit, the children of Abraham. And therefore, if you're a child of Abraham and you read the scriptures and you read the Psalms and you read the prophets, then you should have recognized that Jesus was the Christ. And even maybe you didn't know while he was still walking in the land of Israel. Fine. But after he was crucified, after he rose from the dead, after all these crazy people are telling you that he rose from the dead, after all the soldiers you bribed that were guarding the tomb told them to lie about the resurrection, after, 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 all the miracles, all the testimonies, all that has, that has happened by the time this writing is given, also all the way till today, and it's one thing if you never heard of the Old Testament or the New Testament, but if you're a Jewish person and you read the Old Testament and you don't accept Jesus as the Messiah, as the anointed one, as the fulfillment of the prophecies, as a, the king in the, you know, in, the, in the throne of David, then obviously something is deceiving you. And the deceiver is Satan. And therefore, a synagogue of Jews, as called here, who would not believe in Christ, and not only that, but also be, have enmity against the church. For most of the first, well, even till recently, I would say, maybe even currently, martyrs of the church, right, the actors that instigated some of these persecutions were all well, Jewish people. Uh, so, this is a synagogue of Satan, yet even from that synagogue of Satan, God is able to draw believers. Draw believers. Never. It, it is what I want you to concentrate, not on how bad some other group of people or person can be, but that no matter what, how satanic they might seem, how lost that might be in your eyes. How you can be enemies of the church. Never lose hope that God can bring anyone, right, to do what? To worship to before your feet. And you know why that would happen? For Christ to act in the life of that person so that he can show how the Lord has loved us because we have loved him. Yeah. It's kind of what happens for the sake of the saints. That's why we intercede to the saints. And Jesus is always happy for, their, for his saints to be glorified by performing miracles in their name, okay, in their name. We don't worship the saints, but Christ will do miracles, like bringing somebody from a lost cause to a believer for the sake of the love that we have shown to his name, or for the sake that the saints have shown to his name, okay? So never lose hope, that's what this passage is about, not to contrast how many bad groups are out there, because when we sin, we are also part of that synagogue too. Okay? When we sin and we don't repent, right, we're part of that synagogue. There's no, no category of people, no group of people, no se se section of society that is beyond the reach, might be beyond ours, might be even afraid to speak to somebody, but it's never, never too much of a, say, a, a feat for Christ to achieve, to bring people even from the most unlikely basis to worship at his feet. And then, so that is the first reward for having kept God's word and having not denied his name. And in, in an effort to show his love for us, he will do this. He will also 
keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And those are various, various trials that will come. We know, for example, that the Church of Philadelphia, as we said earlier, does not exist. Why doesn't it not exist? Because, huh? Yeah, it's been overrun by unbelievers. Unbelievers who basically raised the churches to the ground and killed everybody who would possibly uh, have an affiliation with their church. So that's what happened to all these churches. Their lamps, their lamps have disappeared and they have moved on. That's why in Greece there's new Philadelphias and other Philadelphias. And the, the name is spread, but the city, this, this original city was, is gone. And so is all the seven cities of the book of Revelation. But also the trial that comes, again, remember when we interpret the book of Revelation, we interpret it in a very cyclical way, actually like this, like a spring. And every time you turn, you go a little bit higher, higher, higher towards the end. But these trials are repeated over and over again. And these trials for each season, for each season, they are of the kind that no one can survive unless God shows grace and mercy. Unless we receive God's protection, no one can survive the trials of every given season. At the same time, all of us, in the all-knowing mind of God, we are all born in a time and in a setting and in a season that will provide the maximum, in a sense, potential for our salvation. In fact, all of us were born with a 100% chance of salvation Unless, of course, we threw it away. Whether the salvation meant that I grew up in a time of the persecutions and I was martyred at 15, and that's it. Or whether the salvation was that I grew up during communism or grew up during the Ottoman occupation. Or I grew up during this particular period of time where it has relative freedom and comfort and yet has other kinds of temptations. But none of either the martyrs of the first century or the third century or the fifth or the eighth or the tenth or whatever time that were born in exactly the sense to maximize their potential for salvation, including ourselves. Many times we'll say, oh, I wish I was born at the time of Christ. And I would have been at the foot of the cross and crying and waiting to be risen and I would have followed him. Right? Would we? No. That's why we were born now. Would we have made it in the time of Seheralavos, let's say? Right? Could we be okay with being skinned alive? Probably not. That's why we're born now. <laughs> and again, relative comfort. Different kinds of temptations. Maybe if you ask Sechar Alibos, would you like to be born in, uh, in uh, Generation Z or whatever? What, 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 what is it now? You know, Gen Z, right? And you would say, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, absolutely not. I don't want to deal with what you're dealing. The people are cruel. That was Sechar Alibos, we say. One who was skinned alive, but you would say, to, no, 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 no. It's too much cruelty in this world. So every one of us is born. And the common thread is that none of us can be saved without the grace of the mercy of God. And yet it's the most optimum time and space for us to have lived and be given, I would say achieve, but to be given a path to salvation. Okay? But all of them have trials. Every single lifetime has a trial. Now, the ones at the very end, which we don't know how far they are, but the ones at the very end are specifically mentioned in the scriptures as no one would survive if the time of those trials were not cut short. And we'll see that, of course, because if they were allowed to go on, then not even the elect would be able to be saved for whatever. Basically, what that means 
is that God always provides a path to salvation in every single season. And for us personally, it is the maximum, the best, the most optimum time to have been born. In those things that we don't have a choice. We have free will, but we didn't have a free will to be born. And we don't have a free will when to die. When we come into this world and when we get out of this world. Those are sort of God moments, are they not? They're God moments. That's why we don't mess with them, by the way. We don't mess with God moments. That's why we allow God to act. So those are God moments. We don't interfere with the beginning. We don't interfere with the end. What happens in the middle is our choice. And yet, by our own strength, our own choices, we're not going to make it. If we choose to abide by his commandments and not to deny his name, then he will come and protect us at the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on earth. This is not just a cosmic event of apocalyptic event, but that's an event of, I would say, everyday life. Every day, every single day is a microcosm of our whole life. Is it not? And then every week and every month and every year is a microcosm of our whole life. Because we don't know, you know which of these days, one of those days, will be our last day. Okay? We just don't know. So every day is a microcosm of that for us, for our eternal destiny. And the only way to make it true is through God's protection. So and then the other promise. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Quickly. And this is the, I would say, Sagar Albus always said it. You know, he says, Maranatha, come, come, Lord. When are you going to come? When are you going to come? He lived to be 113. He thought for sure by the end of his life that Jesus will come back. Every generation thought he would come back. The millennium people, the first millennium people thought Jesus would come back. Second millennium people, of course, all of us who lived through it thought he was coming back, and now we just keep waiting, right? Come quickly. He says, I'm coming quickly. Of course, what is 2,000 years in Christ? Right? It's kind of that old joke, right? Somebody was asking for a million dollars, right? And God says, wait a minute, right? So, <laughs> right? So, yeah, it's a... It's a minute, your Lord, is like a hundred years to you, right? And a million dollars is like a penny. It's like, okay, can I have a million dollars? Yeah, wait a minute. Yeah. So the um, coming quickly, but he will come. That is a promise. So I'm coming quickly. And just because his quickly is not the same as our quickly, doesn't mean that he's not coming. Okay. He's coming. And the ark is here, and we're going to remain in the ark because we know he's coming. Hold fast, then, what you have, and no one may take your crown. Hmm. Okay, crown. So where, where do we see crowns in the church? Marriage, right? We often make reference in the marriage service and the crowns received by whom? What? Who, which saints? We just celebrated them a couple of weeks ago. The holy, yeah. Specifically, the 40 holy martyrs, right? So do you know the story, the holy 40 martyrs? No, anybody? Celebrate them on March 9th, right? So there were 40 soldiers who somehow found that they were Christians, refused to deny Christ, and their method of execution was to be placed in a, a frozen lake. Yeah. And uh, there they stayed through the night. They put a little gazebo on the edge of the lake in case anyone changed their mind to come out and warm themselves. Uh, and they were teasing them to, you know, come out and, and, you know. But together they huddled and they actually just were praying for each other's strength to make it through the night and to make it to death, to die together. So one person, however, um, walked out, couldn't take it, 
and he went to the uh, little gazebo, whatever, the little hot tub they had, and warmed himself up. The soldiers who were guarding, to make sure they didn't run away, they looked up. One of the soldiers saw 40 crowns descending from heaven upon the heads of the martyrs. However, one of them was going unused because the one person had jumped out. So the soldier, seeing the 40 crowns coming down from heaven, he then says he had the courage to say, I am a Christian too. Whether he converted that particular moment or that he was a secret uh, Christian and then at that time he confessed as well, he jumped to the lake and got the 40th crown. Sadly, the person that jumped to the hot tub died. Uh, Dimitri, tell us why. He went from frozen lake to a hot tub. So... <laughs> well, what happened? His sister went into shock, right? His capillaries all burst and his heart burst, and then he died an awful death. But sadly, so when they pulled out the 40 martyrs out of the frozen lake, there was a young one who was hard enough that he was still kind of half alive. And now he was young, and his mother was actually watching from far away to make sure that he completed his martyrdom. So once they pulled the bodies out of the, out of the lake, they threw them onto a cart to go bury them somewhere. And they, the soldiers realized that the young ones were still alive. So they just threw them off the cart. And uh, the mother actually went, picked up her son, and made sure that he was thrown back onto the, the cart to make sure that he was counted among the other four. What does it say? That... We must do everything we can to hold on to the crown that is promised to every single one of us. To couples, I say, you know, the couples that receive crowns, I say, to, at the service, you receive them freely. You receive them because you have managed to grow into two individuals who become persons, who have become one. You have put the other person standing next to you ahead of your, your own life. And for that selfless act of accepting to make the happiness of the other person more important than the happiness of your own in the sake of Christ, you receive a crown for a few minutes. And then you have to actually earn them. And you earn them in marriage. Okay. Now, we being always positive thinkers. What do we use? We don't actually use crowns in the Greek service, the Greek Orthodox service. What do we use? Wreaths. A lot of wreaths. Yeah. And they always have pretty flowers on them. Right? So uh, we should really be putting thorns on them uh, because that's really more descriptive of married life. Uh, so um, the <laughs> nobody will probably ruin the bride's hair. Uh, so and then, but the prettiest flowers do have thorns in them, don't they? Actually, the more pretty the flowers, sometimes the more sharp the thorns are. But at the end of the day, we have to earn them. And that is a promise made to us, that it's a crown. A crown is something that you have to seek with every fiber of your being. No different than the wreaths of the Olympics, the crowns of championships and Crowns of kingship sometimes, right? People do everything, you know. Uh, I know this is online, but, you know, there's lots of people that want crowns of being bishops, you know. So we, we, we often call it the celibate drool, right? Uh, so some of them, it's honestly so, others for different reasons. However, the crown that Christ promises, right? That one, you know, should be... The only thing that we kind of think about every day. Uh, as, a, as a wedded couple, uh, we usually put those crowns in a prominent place in the house and remember that we have to earn them. Right? If you are a bishop or if you're a priest, you put signs of your ordination. For a bishop, yeah, you put your bishop's crown or whatever, the mitre, and remember the responsibility that that bears. And that it's given in ordination, but it's something that you know you have to earn. And Christ has to give it to you. And Christ, he wants 
to give that to you. But behind it is martyrdom. It's not achieved simply by living what we would call a normal life. Uh, we, we often wouldn't say, well, you know, I just want to be normal. I just want to be normal. What does normal mean? Right? Does it mean minimalist? Right? Usually in society that means I, 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 I aim to achieve mediocrity. Something that's just good enough. A minimalist approach or a mediocrity approach to anything is really damaging. Uh, we can get away with it in terms of, you know, just earthly life and our goals and our aspirations. But when it comes to the spiritual life, we are, we are aiming for a crown. A crown, uh, like a trophy, so to say, right? We live in a society that gives trophies for everything, right? Trophies for participation. Trophies for just being there, right? Not, a, not actually sacrificing or achieving any kind of personal sense of victory over our own imperfections. Not really being challenged. Uh, not really uh, trying to excel. And we are in a society that, that likes to give out trophies of participation. But there are no crowns or trophies of participation in the church. Oh, well, I, you know, I am an Orthodox Christian. Here's my card. Right? I'm a member in good standing and da 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 da. Like, okay, I was there. We ate with you, Lord. We dined with you. We were there. Question is did we excel? Did we actually push? And I would say to our children, we want you to do the best that you can do. Some children are B students, some are A students, some are C students. We don't care as long as actually it's the best that you can do and not the best that you can do comfortably, but the best that you can do by pushing. Okay. All of us here were born because somebody <laughs> pushed, right? I mean, like, oh, I don't know. Maybe this baby will come out, you know? Let's see, you know, if I'm comfortable, right? Either that or you were sliced and diced, you know, as my wife likes to say to our children. Uh, four times, <laughs> you know, four C-sections. But the, uh, but yeah, the narrow gate, you have to be squeezed through there. It doesn't just come half-heartedly. Okay? It doesn't. So the, the promise is, is, a, is a crown, and it's not just achieved by being normal, being sort of everyday, participation in, uh, in the life of the church. The life of the church is there, but we have to push ourselves. The, the minimalist approach is not, is not going to do it. And we'll see it again in the letter to Laodicea because we are looking for a crown. We're looking to be made inheritors of God's kingdom. And that is not just given by birthright, or by so simply participation. That's what the synagogue of Satan thinks. We are children of Abraham. We are students of Moses. By the fact that we are born, right, as children of Abraham, we deserve God's kingdom. It's ours. Why are you teaching it to the Gentiles? That's what pissed off the Jews the most. Okay. So for us, we kind of rest in our Lord. So, well, I'm Greek. I was born in the church. No, we weren't. No one's born in the church. You had to be baptized. Somebody had to vouch for you. Somebody had to sponsor you. Somebody had to actually give birth to you physically. Giving birth to you spiritually is even more demanding and more of a difficult process. It's one thing to give birth to someone, another is to be begotten by someone. We are the begotten children of Abraham. We are his descendants by faith. Not simply resting on uh, living a normal life and my, my, my Greek heritage will carry the day or my you know, participation certificate 
will carry the day. And I outsource all the pushing and the hard stuff. Oh, that's for, what do we say? That's for the papadas, for the monajes, for the, right? Well, what, I'm going to be a, a monajo? I'm going to be a monk? I'm going to be a nun? There is no separate gospels. And that's why it's, you know, when I, when I do visit uh, a monastery and I see what they are doing and how much they push themselves and it becomes an impetus for you to say, okay, I got work to do. 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 That's it. And that urgency to earn a crown. And he who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God and you shall go no more. So it's making reference to the two pillars, giant pillars that were holding up the temple of, of Solomon. Um, so the, the, the pillars represent that once you have put in that work, God will make you unshakable. Right? God will make you unshakable. Uh, what happens? Uh, so I know we don't live in an earthquake prone area, but if, you, if you've seen like houses that have been destroyed, but then you'll see just two pillars that kind of standing up. Right? They are unshakable. Nothing, nothing can take them down, but not because they have some kind of strength on their own, but because God has made them, has made them unshakable. Right? I mean, we talk about the walls of Jerusalem, that the walls of Jerusalem be built. Jerusalem was destroyed. Right? So God builds up the walls. He is the immovable and the unchangeable one. And finally, the last promise is, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. So slaves were usually branded by their owners. Uh, some were visible. So that if they ran away, people would know who they were, who they belonged to. This is what he's talking about. If we belong to him, God will brand us, right? Will brand us with a new name. That new name will be given to us then. What would that new name be? Wouldn't we all like to find out? There's only one way to find out our new name. We have to get there, okay? That is also a promise. So if you don't like your name, hang in there, <laughs> okay? <laughs> right? So living as a Tilemajo, absolutely, you know, please give me a new name, something that people can pronounce, uh, you know, maybe a, a figure in history that was not a wimp, you know? Um, so you know, the, oh no, the story of Tilemajos, right? So Odysseus goes off to fight the Trojan War. Penelope stays behind. They have a little infant son named Telemachus. Of course, the uh, infant son is growing. The Trojan War took 10 years, and of course, then took Odysseus another 10 years to return. So Odysseus at this time is 20 plus, at least. And the whole house of his father, surrounded by suitors, who want to marry his mother and take over the kingship. You're a 20 years old man. Why don't you kick him out yourself? Why don't you take care of it? But instead, he travels around trying to find his father. He went down to Sparta, right? He went over. Look, instead of actually taking care of business, uh, he had to wait for his daddy to come home. And, of course, daddy comes home, and they do together. Killed everybody. Uh, but is known as sort of a wimpy character from mythology and the name literally meaning to fight from far away or rather not to fight at all right? fighting from far away is a wimpy way of fighting uh, although he would fit in perfectly today because everybody fights with drones so that would be his perfect role today so uh, so the name that god will give will be a mystery but we don't know what that name will be but god will brand us with a new name that's exciting. Okay. So that's the promise to the Church of Philadelphia. And we go from a letter of promise to a letter that uh, it is disturbing, but we will cover it nevertheless. Okay. 
Uh, Joanna, would you like to, to read the letter to Laodicea? And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen, the faithful, and to witness the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither poor nor hard. Would that you were poor or hard. So, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have um, prospered, and I need nothing, nor knowing that you are rich, um, rich, visible, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I counsel you to buy from me go. Um, to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may be rich, and white garments to clothe you, and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and serve to anoint your eyes, that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and just chasten, so the jealous and re um, repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in him and uh, eat with him and he, he with me. He who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has been here, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Great. Thank you. So out of all the letters that you probably have heard over the, over the years, this is the one that you probably have uh, heard about because of the very vivid image of Jesus spitting somebody out. Right? And then... Why did he do that? So let's look at it. Um, first, he describes himself as the Amin, the faithful witness, the beginning of creation of God. So this is, again, uh, reaffirmation that Jesus Christ is the Yahweh of the Old Testament. He is the beginning of the creation. It doesn't imply that Christ is created. It doesn't do that. But rather to the works that God has created. So the if we look at it in in, in the Greek, so it's just so there's no confusion. So it's an nominative opistos kialitidos iarchitis tisios to theu. If it was if Christ were to be a creature, right, then it would be tinarchi, it would be in the accusative, it would be as an object. But because they're all nominative, right, they're all describing Christ. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses will take this. Uh, the ones that try to deny the divinity of Christ will take this section. So you see here it says, I am the beginning of the creation of God. So supposedly that God created him. At the beginning, it does not necessarily mean that he is an object of that creation, but rather he is the archetype. He is the, the cause. Christ is the one who creates. Okay, so just as a note, in case anybody ever brings up this passage to you that somehow Jesus is a creature. Again, God knows our works, and Christ, as the initiator of creation, also passes judgment on creation. And here the problem is, yeah, he is neither cold nor hot. What does that mean? What does that mean? I'm sorry? Yeah. So is ever have how would you describe a person that is lukewarm? How would you describe? Have you ever you know how have we ever Cross that in a sense. Person is lukewarm. So, uh, for example, have you ever invited somebody to this Bible study? Right? Have you ever gotten a response saying, Oh, I, I know it? 
I know. I I I know it. I I don't have anything to learn there. I read I read my Bible. Okay? Or I invite them to church and they say what? I pray at home. Right? Or I invite them to church and say, well, I'm, you know, I'm better than those guys. Right? I, or I have a problem with the priest. That's why I don't go. But I mean, I did go and I would like to go, but I have a problem with the priest. Or I have a problem with the parish council member. Or uh, I, you know, I am, I go to church, you know, but I, you know, but I have problem because the church does have this program or that program, or it's in the wrong language. I don't go because uh, the priest speaks too long or, you know, the, the singer, the chanter, something, right? Uh, but I, I pray at home. I read my Bible. I am faithful. I am more spiritual than those guys. I, I'm a better person than those guys. Right? So, so what happens is that the lukewarm person is not a person that, either, that does not live some kind of uh, religious life. Okay. It's, a, it's a person that does not allow to depend on God in his religious life, right? Does not allow to be challenged in his religious life. Does not allow himself to go beyond himself in his religious life. So the, it's, a, it's a very difficult group because it eliminates the possibility of getting better. The possibility of a repentance in a sense, but they don't see a need for repentance because I haven't done this and this and this and this. Uh, but it, it is somebody who, who always is used to, let's say, bad food, but has, doesn't really know better, doesn't want to know better. It's kind of used to that. And, um, you know, you allow yourself to, to kind of go into an indifference or a laziness, just a, a minimalist. Again, it's kind of the theme that runs over from the last letter. Easily scandalized, very easily scandalized. Uh, the church is, yes, it's a meeting place, but there's always looking at what somebody else does wrong or the, the weakness of the clergy, or that uh, the church doesn't have a particular aspect that uh, he would like to see, uh, a particular program, a particular ministry, or always overwhelmed by the corruption that exists in, in different levels of the institution of the church. So uh, a lukewarm person, however, that it's, it's just like lukewarm water. Fault finding in their nature? Absolutely. And easily scandalized, easily kind of taken off the, uh, uh, taken off kind of the possibility of being challenged. So uh, it's, it's, you, you meet them. You know, I mean, there, there's a lot, of, so this happens to somebody that, you know, comes into the church and then allows himself to be, um, sorry, in a sense of self exiled because of the fact that the Holy Spirit really doesn't live there because he does not want to do anything outside of his own comfort zone. He's stuck yeah. in his own ego. Yeah, well, you can't even get past yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you are in your own way. And it, 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 it deprives you of the possibility of repentance. That's, that's the thing. If you're cold, if you're like an animal state, if you're cold, if you're outside of the church and you get a taste of the church, right, then you might want to seek it. Right? If you're hot, you're hot. I mean, that's, we understand what that part is, right? That's, we understand what being filled with the spirit and being filled with the desire to pray, the desire to do good things, the desire to repent, the desire to read, the desire to be here, all those things we understand. To be cold is to be completely distant.
because you've never tasted something at all. But if you're used to something mediocre and you don't want, you do not want to extend the possibility of your spiritual potential because you're comfortable where you're at, you're self-justifying, uh, you are comparing with other people and easily scandalized and using the scandals or the weaknesses of others so you can justify the, pos the, the positions that you have taken in your own spiritual life. And at the end of the day, it's about controlling that position, to be comfortable within that position, to say, to, I do not need the grace and the mercy of God. I can earn the salvation on my own terms. And no one will tell me otherwise. What does the papa know? What does, what do you know? Oh, you go over there and you read your Bible. I know my Bible. You want to know the real Bible? Come to me. Right? I will tell you. I read, and they do. And they read the Bible. And they're very knowledgeable. But they're not listening to it. Right? I read it only to justify my own positions. I read it just so that I can feel better about, you know, the way I think. Whatever doesn't fit within that thought, I put aside. I mean, from yeah. what I'm listening to what you're saying, though, like, objectively, that's all of us every day on some sort of level. I mean, maybe not at super extreme levels, but, like, I mean, I think all of us, when I put it in terms of, like, being you're saying like easily scandalized or fault finding or egotistical, like I don't know, the Greek culture to me is all of those things. <coughs> I, like, you know, and so, but I mean, in a serious sense, though, it's like it's asking for humility and like, okay, well, I'm not going to be perfect, but it's asking for humility and saying, like, okay, well, I'm not going to be perfect, but it's asking for humility and saying, like, okay, well, I'm not going to be perfect, but it's asking for humility and saying, like, okay, well, I'm not going to be perfect, but it's asking for humility and saying, like, okay, well, I'm not going to be perfect, but it's asking for humility and saying, like, okay, well, I'm not going to be perfect, but it's asking for humility and saying, like, okay, well, I'm not going to be perfect, but it's asking for humility and saying, like, okay, well, I'm not going to be perfect, but it's asking for humility and saying, like, okay, well, well, did, 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 you, did you notice, right, so the, so, so when he continues to say, I know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Those titles are ours. Okay. We are all in this category. Okay. To some degree. Okay. Right, so it's it's probably easier to call ourselves these names, right? To be wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It's better to call ourselves these names before Christ does, right? Before He does. If we call ourselves these names, we have the chance of getting out of the lukewarm category. Because, yes, the lukewarm category is, it belongs to the entire church. Like he talks in the verse about, like, overcoming, I'm assuming it's, like, overcoming yourself, but, like, and I mean, it's, like, thinking about it, really trying to think about it, it's a monastic life. Like, it's withdrawing mm -hmm. from society, it's giving. So it's, like, okay, well, I have to get home tonight and do stuff for my <laughs> I don't really know how to balance that. Like, I don't know how to read that. Person. Yes. Like, well, I'm gonna go home and like, you know, I he's mean, saying, he's saying it's revolting. That's why I'm saying when the tongue flew out of my mouth, ready? Mm -hmm. hey, God wants you to be either cold or hot, right? It's right yeah. there next to the verse. So, yeah, the warm is to choose one of those things, choose one of those things, and be it. Don't be lukewarm because I'll vomit you out of my mouth. This is revolting. I know, but like within the world every day, like it's really hard to like to me to say to not be lukewarm means to like devote yourself 100% to God and withdraw from things. And if you're in the world and of the world, that's like a hard balance. Again, <laughs> this is why, like, this is why the, the challenge is that that we cannot do this without the grace and mercy of God. That our, our life, our challenge right now is not to remain in the lukewarm category. 
but it is the, it is the truth that as a as a church we are institutionally lukewarm yeah the church of the first century was institutionally hot why because being a christian at that time was punishable by death okay so you didn't belong there and actually actually were 100% in it and yes when the church christianity became legal and then everybody entered to the church right we talked about the fence we talked about the boiling water you keep adding cold water in it what happens the water is not boiling anymore right unless that fire is continuously sustaining right so the so what happens everybody's let in the fence so it, it gave birth to monasticism gave birth to people fleeing into the desert to live the life of this hot category okay a fully spiritual life yes a fully spiritual life a fully devoted life and they felt that they can only live it in the desert not that it couldn't be lived in the world but now it became increasingly hard it's no different than try to keep a pot of boiling water where people keep pouring in cold water keep pulling in ice and you're trying and you're trying and you're trying the key is where is your desire to understand that we're lukewarm to understand that we are miserable wretched poor blind and naked take that title on take all those five titles on Right? all of them contain in the category called lukewarm and knowing that if i stay as we said in the previous letter normal right unchallenged just kind of going through a participatory life right just being just going through the normal things i go to church and and i go home and and this goes through things you get to call at the communion you know four or five six times a year and, and i do this and i do that and without every day pushing lighting a fire under yourself right it's just like a pot of boiling water unless you keep it on the fire it will stop boiling the minute you introduce even just a cup of cold water or even if you just let it sit it stops boiling so what you want to do is you always want to light a fire under you because if i do nothing we are institutionally lukewarm if we were cold meaning that we were never introduced to christ at all or in fact we lived in an atheist house that never went to church never read the bible yes we were somehow you know orthodox christians maybe perhaps but we were completely out of the church then it's a whole different ball game but all of us here collectively this evening we are all part of the lukewarm institutional church which became lukewarm truly after the persecutions were over and and until the persecutions come back we will remain lukewarm so it remains on each one of us personally or perhaps a small group of people as i said we gather here today to light this fire under our behinds and and be challenged want to be challenged by each other okay want to be challenged by each other accept our titles of wretched miserable poor blind and naked not be insulted when somebody challenges us and say okay i know i need have work to do i know i have work to do and there here come the distractions the distractions are the fact that your priests and your bishops are lukewarm and they're having a turkey sandwich on good friday and they are you know not doing what they're supposed to be doing and there's scandals in the church and the scandals in the pagari and the scandals in the this and this and and we is like oh we know this is what's going on scandals in the lives of our fellow prisoners you know so and so has a pants on so and so has a uh, mini skirt on so and so walked late so and so has a makeup so and so is gossiping it's talking it's not paying attention <laughs> if god accepts us to speak to him accepts us to call him our father accepts to actually listen to us and actually come and as the final the end of the epistle says to 
dine with us and willing to make room for us on his throne and sit down and eat with us. And doesn't mind, he overlooks our imperfections. Does he not? He overlooks our imperfections. He's like, I'll come sit with you. I know you're not perfect. I'm knocking at the door. If all you have to do is open it to me. And yes, when I dine with you, I will fix you. I will kind of smooth over the wounds of your imperfections. But he doesn't wait for us to achieve a level of perfection before he comes to be with us. Or at least we're hoping that he comes to us now. We're never going to be perfect before we go to communion. We're never going to be perfect before we go to church. Okay. Sometimes I, I haven't been to a doctor in like three years because I know what they're going to say. So I want to actually lose some weight before I actually go to the doctor. You know, But that's a kind of a futile effort. It's never going to happen. You know, so what does happen every Sunday, every day, every time I go to my prayer corner, God, I mean, have you ever like been ticked off at somebody and you just don't want to talk to them, right? Or like you get triggered just by the sound of their voice, right? Have we all had people like that in our life? Do you ever get triggered just because their name pops up on your caller ID? And like, right? Ignore, ignore. You know, right? So, and yet, God, we accept God. Yeah, just pick up. Yeah, listen, you got it. Anytime we want, okay, okay, Jesus, let me, let me. Why? And by the way, He is perfect, and we are not. But yet, we hang up or we don't answer the call of a fellow imperfect being. Because their imperfections trigger us. I say, okay, well, maybe you're right. Because you're going to get angry and going to yell at the person, then, 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 don't answer the phone. But we should, you know, what, what we are doing with God is we actually ask God to listen to us, to be with us, to dine with us, to live inside of us with our consistent imperfections. And we are going to let the whatever, the real scandals or the real problems or the real distractions from around us, distract us from the work at hand, knowing. Now, we, we allow that to happen. I allow that to happen. I ignore because I have other friends. I mean, I have a phone full of contacts. There's plenty of people that would like to talk to. So this person, I don't want to talk to, so ignore. Right? But what if every... You know, if, if God did that, we'll be in very, very deep trouble, okay? Uh, he would just simply do what? Spit us out of our mouth. I guess every right to, because we are part of that category, okay? We are part of that category. So what do we do? Do we spit out the lukewarm people around us, people that are not neither our friends nor our enemies? I mean, the people that are cold to us will never call. The people that are hot to us, yeah, we're glad. Most of the contacts that we have, they're probably, eh, look one. So what do we do with them? Yes, Yes, It gives you the same, though. If, I mean, there are times that you don't feel like talking to somebody. <laughs> it doesn't mean that, that you have a problem or whatever. But maybe it's a, even a family member, you know, and still you don't feel like talking that particular time. Is that a scene? It can be very intrusive. I mean, if it's not about the person, if it's about timing, like if you haven't done your family, you don't answer your phone. But if it's about the person themselves, like if it was someone else, you would gladly answer it, but because it's them, you don't. Okay, then what are you doing? You are symbolically spitting them Right yeah. out of your mouth, you are rejecting them, okay. right? Or you, they are in a in a fellowship hall. They are sitting in a pew, right? They are in the communion line. I go to the other communion line, right? So if I have any issues 
Right? So if we don't, we know we are lukewarm. So if you change your way, <laughs> if we want, right? If we want God not to, and we know that God will spit us out of His mouth, we know we're there because we know we're not cold because we're here. We know we're not hot because we know we're not hot. Okay, <laughs> that part we know. Okay, we want to. We want to, and that's our desire. That's why we're here. We're lighting a fire under ourselves every day so with our desire. But we know we are lukewarm, and we know that God will spit us out of his mouth. We know we are wretched, miserable, blind, poor, and naked. All right? So what we're going to do is we don't want God to reject us. Okay? So we definitely not going to reject others. Okay? So how do we become, in a sense, that other category, right? How do we become the other category? We become hot, so to say, little by little, not just in our personal you know, relationship to God by building up that desire, but how we interact with one another and the lukewarm people we perceive around us, okay? How do we, how do we perceive them? Do we get, like I said, easily distracted, easily scandalized, easily tired of each other? Okay. It's it is a, it's an issue that the the the, the sooner we get, become comfortable with those titles, okay, the more urgent for us is to actually come out of that category, to uh, to understand the category and know that we need to come out of it. That's why he says. That's why he says by. From me, gold refined in the fire so you may be rich, and white garments so you may be clothed. Okay. Buy gold. How do you buy gold? Right. Overlook the lukewarmness and the imperfections and the scandals of the people around you. Okay. Become completely blind and deaf to the sins of one another. Okay? And put on the white garments, meaning that become obsessed with these titles of wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. We have to become obsessed with those titles and say, yes, that's what I am. Right? And with a sense of urgency to say, Kiri Ales, Lord have mercy. It's that urgency, knowing that we're going to get spit out of the mouth of God. It's that urgency that we need to get out of the lukewarm. It's not okay to be normal in what is considered a normalized lukewarm church. Okay. That is our issue. Yes. I'm just thinking that's the message of the public focusing on our own needs. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then we have others and then even taking it to the other about the prodigal son. I mean, we stray, we, we seek the wrong things, and then we have to come into ourselves and return. Mm-hmm. So it's the message of both of us. Yeah. It is, it is, right? It's the message of not focusing on the imperfections of others. The older brother focused on the imperfections of the younger brother and the prodigal son. And we allow the, the symptoms, right, the scandals of a lukewarm institution Call the church, right? To, uh, in, in a sense, be comfortable in a lukewarm position for ourselves. What is the trial of this time, of this season in which we live? Is that, yes, we have a lukewarm institutionalized church. And the cry is, save yourselves, right? Your priests or your bishops are not going to save you. We are in a lukewarm institutionalized church, okay? And that you know, we perceive what is hot as something happens somewhere else in a monastic setting. No, that fire, right? That hotness needs to be pursued here. And it will not happen by just being, again, a participant in an institutionalized lukewarm church. Now, should we demand that our church become hot? Absolutely. We should demand it. It doesn't seem to be a priority. Everybody's just comfortable with things, the way things 
are. And yes, when monastics did come, right, to this land, and, and I get it, you know, what happened in this country? What happened in this country when monasticism sort of tried to light a fire under this church? Right? It wasn't understood and it was not welcomed. It was not understood and it was not welcomed. It was seen as otherworldly. It was seen that the, the hotness of the church should be in its social uh, um, uh, ethos, like in these social works, uh, you know, the feeding and clothing and, 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 and social programs, civil involvement, civil, civil engagement, all things wonderful. Okay, but if they don't come from a hot church, right? Something that is, is focused completely on, you know, on the life centered in, 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 the, in, the, in the Holy Spirit, in the sacramental and ascetical life of the church. If it's not rooted in there, it, it doesn't work backwards. This is what this one is saying. It says, you are comfortable. It says, you know, I will, because you say I am rich, you have become wealthy. You have need of nothing. Okay? You have need of nothing. Which means what? Uh, especially in America, right? We are wealthy. We are feeding the poor. We're clothing the, the naked. We are building these beautiful cathedrals. We're building this beautiful church. We have beautiful iconography. We have beautiful vestments and chalices and all these programs and schools and, 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 and. Okay. And says, we are building essentially the Tower of Babel. We are going to save ourselves by our works, but not by prayer, not by sacrifice, not by ascesis. Not by ascesis, fasting, prayer, charity, right? The charity, the, the mercy part. To, first of all, to be merciful towards each other. So we're not on each other's throats over who's going to be, you know, uh, leader, which jurisdiction is going to lead here, which jurisdiction is going to lead there. That's what we do as Orthodox. We are cannibalizing each other as parishes, as jurisdictions, right? We are overwhelmed by all the cares of this life. We're overwhelmed about our civil, uh, again, engagement. We're overwhelmed by being recognized as a, as a, as a, as a, say, a religious institution by society at large. And yes, the Greeks were persecuted at the beginning. It's not an issue really anymore. We don't need to show that we have arrived, but we go out of our way to show that we have arrived by having events that's very prestigious and very wealthy kind of shiny places. So we are in an institutionalized lukewarm church. And when somebody tries to light a fire, they're usually called what? Fundamentalists, fanatics, right? And it's just simply lighting a fire. If you read the encyclicals of Archbishop Michael, who served from 1948 to 1958, and he spoke about confession, about vigils, about the sanctified liturgies, about the solemn vespers during Lent, about ascesis, asceticism, ascesis, to exercise okay, our spiritual muscle in the church. I mean, it was amazing. And then, of course, there was a huge switch after he passed in 1958, things changed. Right? What he's talking about is just the reality of the church and, and, the, and the members in it. That the church is the same as again. Our, everyone's life is a very is a microcosm. If you don't push, so I recently started exercising. I hadn't gone to a gym in like three years, so I discovered there's a gym just up the street, and uh, and one of the parishioners here that you know he kind of urged me, let's do it together, you know. And it's true, right? When you exercise, if you just walk, it does. Nothing. It's something, but it doesn't really make you better. If you exercise, so we're walking on the treadmill, and the guy says, "Well, listen, you need to, you know, you have you have to hit your heart rate, and you have to maintain that, whatever, one thirty for twenty minutes." And like, really, <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's like, well, how do you do that? It's like I can't, I can't run. 
I mean, that's not going to happen. So it's like, well, I'll just put an incline, just put it going uphill. And that way you don't have to go too fast, but, you know, your heart will start, you know, going where it's supposed to go. I'm like, okay. So you're saying if I walk flat, it's not going to happen? It's like, no. Like, unless you actually push yourself to run. I'm like, okay. So it's either running or going uphill. Okay, like, I, I'm going to go uphill. But, again, unless you challenge, you push. Okay? We're looking for a crown. We're looking for the kingdom of God. We're looking for something hot. You are, all those things that we have seen in the last few letters, it's, it's again, it's it's our will to allow God to light a fire under us and burn away the things that he doesn't seem for us to be necessary, right? And allow him to burn away our passions, okay? And push ourselves into healing, into restoration of who we're supposed to be. We are to be filled, right? Hot, the fire of the Holy Spirit. And that to happen, especially at a time where it's comfortable, and we are wealthy, relatively. I mean, here we're all wealthy. When compared to the rest of the world, we are all super wealthy. Okay? Super wealthy. Uh, let me put it this way. How many of you have a roof that's actually made of roofing material? Okay. Imagine all everybody. Has everybody lived with, like, uh, basically uh, leaves on top of your roof? Okay. So how about when you walk into your house and you press a switch? Does the light go on? Perfect. And this one is a little harder. Do you drink? Is it possible to drink the water that comes out of your faucet? Yeah. I mean, I know we prefer filters or bottled water, right? But is it possible to drink that? Yeah. Do you have to, like, go out to a, to a well? Yeah. Right? Do, you have to, do you go outside to the bathroom? All right. So you are wealthier than 90% of the world. Okay? So that puts you in the top 10%. Therefore, we are all wealthy. Okay? What we don't have, though, is a hot church. So the trial that is taking place right now is not just, you know, the, the, the everyday things. That it's the trial that we got. We are in a lukewarm Christian environment. Right? If you are inside a hot church, it's easy. Right? You all push each other. Right? You give each other the kiss of peace. It might be the last time you see each other. But when you're in a lukewarm church, you almost have to do it on your own. You have to save yourself as a priest, as a bishop, as a people. Now, if like here, this is why this makes me happy. Is if we can light our little bit, a fire underneath us, all of us collectively. It makes it a little bit easier to maintain a fire when you have a whole bunch of people actually trying not to blow it out. Right? And yes, if you step outside of here, he's like, oh, yeah, what, what did you do over there? Bible study. What are you thinking? You don't know nothing. You know, I, why Why even buy? Well, who do you think you're going to be? A, a saint? I think in this years. Right? Is that what you're trying to do? That's why you're going to church again. That's why you, you know, you forgave so-and-so. That's why you, right? Is that why you don't stand up to? Right? That's why you always answer your phone. Right? That's why you shouldn't always answer. This is very intrusive. It's very intrusive. Okay? It is. It is. But, you know, you should try to, like, call them back at least. But, or at least send them a text say, you know, it's not a good time. But it, it is very intrusive. It, it, it's very demanding. I, I, you know, you all feel it. You all know it. And, um, you know, the, blessed were the times where, you know, it was a lot harder to, you know. I, but we appreciated our communication a lot better. Uh, before. Uh, now it's more like, uh, uh, Father, I had water three hours ago. Can it take a meeting? You know? <laughs> it's like, really? You call me for that? Okay. <laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry? Embrace your title and try to change. Yeah. Understand that if we stay that way, right, and you can receive accolades within the lukewarm church for being a good Christian, lots of them. You can be an archon, you can be, you know, uh, leadership this and parish council that and archdiocese that and this, the other. You could be a priest and a bishop, right? Don't get comfortable. We are in a lukewarm church. Your job 
is to rise, not in a judgmental way, you know? We should not be like, I'm rising, I'm leaving you guys behind, you know? But to know that you need to do more than be a participant in a, in a lukewarm church. And that would look yeah. different for every person. Yes, it would. It would. And it would be, be a very personal thing as well. It would be a very personal endeavor. You know, but it would be, one, I'm no longer distracted by the lukewarmness of others because I understand where I am. Right? My job is not to make somebody else lukewarm. Make sure that I encourage their desire to be hot and then work on being hot myself. So by the grace and the mercy of God, because if I rely on my own strength, I would never make it because I live in a very lukewarm environment. Okay? Surrounded by an ocean of cold water. I'm talking just within the church itself. Yeah. In essence, like if you think of the church, the church has not lost any of its quality and ability and warmth to save us. But we are in a very ice cold, okay, all the, surrounded by an ice cold environment. And we have become lukewarm because we have kind of let the fences open. And why we leave the fences open? Because we are made that way by, you know, as an institution, not just now, but since the time of Constantine. Once it became free, it became custom, a tradition to be a Christian, then, and that is why you see this symbiotic relationship between parish life and monastic life, okay, you see that, I mean, so, God forbid if the monasteries become, you know, also institutionalized, I'm not saying there's no lukewarm monks and nuns, there's plenty of them, but as an institution, they are acting sort of as warming stations, <laughs> you know? Sometimes they're acting the opposite. There's plenty of monasteries that do the opposite, but they are designed to act as warming stations, okay? Are there monasteries that act the opposite? Absolutely, just like their parishes that are completely cold, completely cold. Right? And our job is you know, that this, we understand this is gonna happen, and our job is often is like, well, I'm not going to be comfortable with this environment. I have work to do. My family has work to do. My group of friends here, we have work to do. Not being comfortable is the key. In this life, we can, we can bat ourselves back again. We get trophies for everything. We're not going to get a trophy for being just normal, lukewarm, participants in, in this life. Okay? Yes? I just want to go back to 1900 when people came here and built their churches. Those people that had to be taught, they had to be thirsty for the church, for our faith. Us generation and the younger generation, we're comfortable because we found everything ready. We try to do whatever we can, but think the people who came here and built the churches, they built most of the churches. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, most of the churches were built, right, as, and with great sacrifice, yeah. okay. The, what, what happened is, it's one thing to build a building, right. another thing to build a community of believers. Those are two different things. Uh, and while they, among them, and of course, none of these churches would not have been built if there wasn't, there weren't people of faith among them. But what did happen in the 1900s, 1930s, and 40s, and 50s, and 60s, and 70s, and 80s was what? That the, the walls were built, the buildings were built, but the people were not. Because not, you know, again, not without exception, but as a rule, what happened in, in, in many of those instances and in many situations is that one of the goals was, well, first of all, the, the impetus was for uh, cultural schools, and cultural institutions, okay, attached to churches. So many of our churches, for example, were first built as Greek schools and then as churches. You first built a Greek school because you wanted your kids to learn Greek, and then you brought a priest from Greece to 
maintain, and one of his roles was to maintain the Greek identity of its people uh, and the Orthodox identity, but which one came first? It was always the ethnic. In some occasions was the Orthodox, but you know, at most was 50-50, okay? That has not changed, okay? That has not changed. I've brought this example many times before. I'll bring it again. <clears throat> In our community, which is very typical of a community in Chicago, this community, my community, whatever, since pair of two. I mean, very typical. It's not nothing against, right? Um, how many hours do we teach Greek school a week? Four. Four, Four hours, right? Um, are the teachers paid? Yes. Uh, do the kids' families pay tuition? Yes. Do the kids have homework? Do they do their homework? Yeah. Okay. Are they expected to do something? Yes. Are they expected to have a Greek school program for March 25th? Yes. Is there some religious taught, religion taught in them? Yes. But the majority of it is for the Greek language, which is absolutely great. Nothing against religious education. How many hours do we teach religious education? 45 minutes. 45 minutes at best. Are the teachers paid? Is there tuition? Do the kids have homework? Are they expected to do homework? All righty then. So what are we doing? Hmm? Right? Where is, you know, now, by all means, the Greek culture is so intertwined with the Orthodox faith that when it's added into the, in a sense, the pot of water that is the church, at least it is lukewarm too. Because the Orthodox, you know, Greek culture has been intertwined with Orthodoxy so long that it doesn't actually cool it off. Now, once you add festival, gambling, alcohol, sports, basketball specifically, right? How many, how many hours do we have basketball every week? Quite a bit, right? Uh, at least our volunteers, blah, 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 blah. But what does basketball provide in, in this? Once you pour basketball into the life of a cazarola, of a child's soul, what happens when you pour in basketball? At best, it would be room temperature. Most of the time, it is what? Ice. Okay? What happens to what we call a community to do a festival? Right? It's a lot of work, sucks up all the oxygen from the community in terms of volunteerism. It's a great event. It makes money to pay for the buildings, to pay for salaries, to pay, 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 pay. But what does it do to the life of the church? Right? And alcohol. Right? And gambling. And, you know, considering that we have to spend, what, $30,000 on security to keep the place safe. What does that tell you? What does that pour into the cazarola, which you call it, right? It's a big bucket of ice water. Okay? Big bucket of ice water. Same goes with every event that doesn't reinforce, doesn't light a fire. Right? It actually blows out a fire. Okay? And when each one of us is struggling to have a fire lit under us, Okay? And the church itself is actually pouring water on your own fire. Right? Now you say, why do we do those things? Well, why, why do those things happen? Because we build buildings, but we did not have people mature enough to maintain those buildings without selling alcohol, food, and entertainment. Were they mature enough? Because everybody wants to build buildings so they can stick their name on it. Okay? But they don't know what to do with those buildings once they're built. Okay, because the greatest inheritance you can leave, right, the church, right, is not a building, it's your children, it's your relics, it's your holy life. We've done a great job in the name of Hellenism and the church to build churches and schools, but we didn't build the church, it's people. 
okay? Because there were, well, two factors. One, we came from a country that, you know, there too, the church as an institution was lukewarm at best because it came out of slavery and it was highly uneducated, right? Um, Orthodox kind of life, right? I mean, the priests were uneducated. What happened in the, in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and the 60s? The bishops would say, send me somebody with a suit and I send him back in Arasa, right? Basically, as long as you knew how to read, uh, you know, if you knew how to read, you became a priest. But they didn't trust the priest to preach. That's why they had to be a preacher or a, or a little bulletin because they couldn't trust the priests to actually educate the people. People believed. There's a lot of people that believe. Again, this is a gen I'm talking about. Are there always believers in them? Absolutely. Lots of holy souls. And for whose sake the churches were built. But the communities, the people were not. As, as a general rule. And we know that by because of the attrition rate. And because of the situation that still is true to this day. Four hours of cultural education half hour of religious education. And if we ask the parents of the religious education to pay a thousand dollars a child, right? To educate their children in religion, then how many people would be there? How many parents would be willing to pay a thousand dollars a child per year to educate their child in this? I don't know, it's a question to ponder, but we continue, right? The lukewarmness of this, because we are comfortable in our wealth, in our heritage. We are Greek, so we're special and God will have a nice place for us. You know, simply on a participatory, we are different than them, right? We also have that issue. We're different than them, right? But at the same time, we don't want to be different. And that's why the church wasn't built up because as the churches were built in this country, we're also not, we didn't want to be very different than the rest of the world. So we had one foot inside the fence and one foot outside. We want to be American and we want to be Orthodox. And, you know, whatever it suited us to be, you know, which one. And while we refused to, marry those two things, right? We refuse to marry those two things, to bring them together. We maintain our Greekness in the church, right? But we, you know, how, if you maintain your Greekness in the church, then how are you expecting to marry Americanism and Greekness together in an orthodoxy and becomes basically nothing? And this is what we have, okay? So, uh, the fire is supposed to burn away things that are not needed. But when we hold down to our passions and we hold down to our ideals and we hold down to programs that, you know, they don't really add to the, the, the to what's needed, meaning that we all need a fire under us, what do you think is going to happen? So each one of us, we have work to do, save ourselves, right? The institution in itself you know, well, it's in theory, it's salvific, right? But in practice, you know, we we have, uh, we know, we have to embrace this kind of wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked status. Okay, the God is knocking at the door, so that we understand. God is continually knocking at the door, and He doesn't want, doesn't want to knock at the door, come in and, and bust us, but He wants to come in and dine, come in and dine with us to make room on his throne. The prize is too important, too high for us to ignore and too important for us to say, well, you know, we don't want to rock the boat. We're comfortable the way we are. Okay. So unless we do something drastic, you know, we're going to keep Christ close, you know, behind the closed door, you know, to allow Christ to come in and dine with us and be with us. Uh, it's no different than here. We, you know, we are very comfortable. It would be wonderful, right, to understand that Christ is here in our midst. 
right? All of our events in church, from the parish council, to the Philoptimus meeting, to every committee meeting, to every festival, to every dinner, to every event, everything in our church should be a place where Christ is allowed to walk through that door. Okay? Okay? We cannot no longer have things happening in our church life and in our personal life, right? In which we say, well, Jesus kind of stay there, right? This is kind of a different realm. I need to be mean to this person or I need to, right? I, you know, Jesus, you know, stay over there for a minute. No, every, if we, every person, Christ has to be sort of in the middle of every word, every conversation, every activity, every every thought, every gathering, right? So in our personal lives, our family lives, and especially in our church lives, if there's anything, you know, I told you before we had a clergy gathering one time and it got heated and I had my daughter there. And some, another priest said, you know, stood up and says, no children should be here, right? And and I asked I asked him then if a child cannot be here can Christ be here, right? Yeah. So maybe we should behave, right? Yeah. If our behavior is not proper for a child to watch, then would it be proper for Jesus to watch? Right? I don't know if there would be much of a distance there, would it? Right? So the things that we wouldn't do, right? I wouldn't say. If Christ was present, see, he wants to come in, not to chastise us, right? He says, I stand at the door, right? I stand at the door, and if anyone hears my voice, opens the door, right? And 